So this is a panel about uh, manipulative and deceptive design techniques used by websites and various applications. Um, and they're usually used by websites to trick people into making decisions that might not be in their best interest, as our panel will explain in more detail. And it can result, uh, it can impact in particular on disadvantaged and vulnerable group. Um, so this panel will concentrate, will, will do some framing of the issue, and then it will concentrate mainly on policy solutions in the US and the EU. And we have four incredibly distinguished speakers, and I'll introduce them from left to right. Uh, so we have the member of the European Parliament, the Greens Party, uh, Kim Va Van Sparentak. Yes. 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 <laughs> yes, yes, that's my name, that's my name. <laughs> and then we've got Kat Zhu, who is a technologist um, from Design Ethically, but she also in her spare time works for Spotify. And then we've got the distinguished commissioner, Rebecca Slaughter, from the Federal Trade Commission. And last but not least, Finn Mirstadt from the Norway Consumer Council. So what we're going to do, we don't have presentations. It's a discussion. Um, we will involve the audience, but actually, if you have any burning point to make in the middle of the discussion, Please raise your hand and say you want to make a comment. I don't know if there's a microphone to do that. Oh, yeah, there is one there. So come to the microphone, not, not the most practical solution, but hopefully it works. And I'll start with you, Finn. Can you tell us a little bit, you've done a lot of research, why is it considered harmful to consumers and citizens? Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. And great to see so many people here. And I really hope you, you take Anna on the word and you're not afraid of speaking up here. I know there are so many knowledgeable people in this room and we really want to include you. So please, uh, don't hesitate. So um, deceptive designs is something, as Anna said, we see everywhere, right? It could be on your mobile phone. It could be when you're clicking at these useless cookie banners. It could be when you're playing a video game. It's basically everywhere, and um, there's been done a lot of great research in this field the last few years. Uh, I know a few of the very distinguished academics are also in this room today, uh, and they can attest to how there are various forms of harms relating to deceptive designs, and it could be related to your financial status, right? Whether you're uh, locked in a subscription and can't get out, for example, or whether you're tricked into buying more items than you were planning to, or were pushed into doing it. Um, the financial harms can be quite massive, and on scale, they're huge. And as Anna said in her uh, introduction, uh, vulnerable groups are at particular risks because research has shown, let's say, uh, less educated people are more vulnerable to these kinds of, of deceptive designs. So you can also see that uh, differences, whether it is related to privacy or financial harms, can be increased uh, when you look at vulnerable groups. And then obviously this is a conference about privacy and we, we can see so many examples of how people are being tricked, manipulated, uh, deceived into giving up your data. And this is fueling the whole modern um, business models of today, right? The Googles and the Facebooks are getting all their data through using deceptive designs. And this is stuff we've uh, uh, documented through various reports. I have a few copies here if anyone wants them. Um, and it allows for uh, discrimination at scale because people are being profiled. It means people can be targeted based on their vulnerabilities. So it is an issue of discrimination and uh, manipulation. Um, and this data is also creating data monopolies. So there are lots of different harms. And also the fact that people cannot uh, easily, um, how do you say, um, get your rights respected. So you try to get out of a, a subscription trap, you're trying to get a refund, but the dark patterns are preventing you from doing so. Also creates this feeling of powerlessness amongst consumer, which is bad for all the rights that we have and that we're entitled to. And to push it to, to, push it to sort of the, to the very end of the spectrum, 
there are people now arguing, uh, authors like Susie Allegra, who just published a book on the freedom to thought, that this is even challenging our basic human right, a fundamental human right of freedom to thought, where one of the three components of your right to freedom to think is a right not to be manipulated. And with all this data being collected about us, we can definitely ask ourselves, that we're being manipulated. So those are just some of the harms that I'm seeing out there, and I'm sure others will be able to complement uh, this uh, presentation. Thanks a lot, Finn. Um, Kat, that's a lot of uh, harms put on the door of the industry. Can you explain to us a bit more how is it possible and why is it so profitable to industry, if it is, to do that? Sure. Again, thank you, everyone, for coming here. Um, I want to just clarify, I'm not representing my company at all. Um, and yeah, I think you brought some really interesting points up. One thing that I also want to underscore related to what you were saying was just that this is like a, an attack on our autonomy in, in some ways. And we already have so much digital fatigue as it is, as just everyday consumers. We're always faced with these consent options. And, and there's a lot of different you know, legalese that we're exposed to you know, in the terms and conditions. And so it's tiring on us. And it shouldn't be our responsibility, right? And I think there's a lot of neoliberal framing that says that it's up to you to protect yourselves, but that needs to be something we have to overturn. Um, from a company perspective, I think the reason why these companies are doing it is because they can. And there's no you know, policy saying that they can't. And I think also within the design industry, these practices have been normalized. Um, and they've had the road paved for them for many, many decades. And not just within tech, but also from you know, brick and mortar stores, within other forms of advertising as well. Um, the difference is, though, with digital experiences, it's a lot more pervasive, subtle, and it's, it's far more scalable, so that makes it a, a lot more dangerous in that way. Um, and you know, within designers and, and their own craft and journey, they're learning these practices in schools. They're learning them on the job. These things are very normalized, and it's something that we have to kind of reconcile with ourselves within the industry. Thanks a lot. Kim, Rebecca, do you want to add anything to this? Yeah, what I, what I think is, is very interesting about the whole discussion about manipulation that we're, we're often talking about consumers, right? Um, and I think it's very interesting to look at, you know, what does, what's the definition of a consumer? A consumer in principle is someone who pays for a product. And we all know that that's not the case on, on most uh, of the websites that we know and we have the most proof of that they use these harmful uh, manipulative uh, systems. Um, so I think it is very interesting to, to see when we're talking about the framing of the problem, um, who is actually sort of protected from manipulative um, uh, systems and who is not, and um, who should be protected and not. I'll, I'll jump in there um, with two thoughts. A at least in US law, you don't have to pay for something to be a consumer. If you're using it, you are a consumer. So I think we don't, I'm glad we don't draw a distinction because I think where we want to be thoughtful is about all users, whether you are using as a consumer, you are using as a worker, uh, as part of your um, employment systems. Um, so I think that's one thing that's important to note. And the other thing, um, I actually want to take a step back because I think uh, maybe we it occurred to me listening to this conversation that we might have started with um, a definition and we didn't. Um, we sort of dove right into the problem. And so I, I just want to make sure we're all on the same page when we're That's talking important. about manipulative design practices. What are we talking about in practice? specifically in practice and dark patterns. So when I use the term dark patterns, I mean the design of a product in order to encourage its user to make a choice that may not line up with that user's actual preferences and opinions. So whether that's um, getting tricked into a negative option repeat subscription or sharing more data than you intend to share or realize you're sharing. Um, I, that's what I think of. I think of a, a design that purposely pushes a consumer in one direct or user in one direction inconsistent with her preferences. Um, and that's why I think Kat's point about autonomy is really important. That was exactly the word I was thinking about when Finn was talking about harms, that a lot of these harms go back to limitations on our personal autonomy and ability to uh, meaningfully participate in the world around us uh, with 
with actual um, decision making power over our lives, our data, our information, what we share, what we buy, um, what is known about us, all of those different elements. Thank you very much for that. Actually, that's a very good point. I, I started straight into the subject because I assume we have a very docked audience that understand these issues. Can I just ask you generally how many of you are familiar with this phenomenon, with these design practices? Can you raise your hands if you know? And, and, do you, and I'm interested if anyone disagrees with the definition that I offered, because, and not trying to put you on the spot, yeah, because, yes. right, we use these terms, I think, in tech in particular, and we often use the same terms to mean very different things, and then it's difficult to have yeah. a meaningful conversation. So I'm interested if yeah. other people think differently. I think you, gentlemen, you wanted, I think... Can you identify yourself when you speak, please? Yeah, my name is Mark Leiser from the University of Leiden. Uh, I've been working with Finn and uh, Kat as well. So, um, uh, yeah, I mean, there's something about dark patterns and uh, the idea that it infringes autonomy and that it goes against our actual preferences, but it doesn't account to all dark patterns don't always do the thing. If you're being nagged into doing something, it might not necessarily be against your actual preferences. It's just the repetition is reminding you to constantly do it, so you do it at a different time than when it might be optimal for you to think about it. Um, if you're being harassed by you know, consistent pop-ups, those amount to being dark patterns, but it might not be that it goes against your actual preferences. Um, I think there's a whole slew of different dark patterns that don't necessarily fall under that definition. Um, but. So, what's a, so is it a better term to have users make choices that they wouldn't otherwise make, or at, you know, either in substance or in time? Um, yeah, I think I, I think I think that the danger with all of those comes that we're only looking at the user interface dark patterns rather than system architecture dark patterns. <laughs> that's um, a great point, point. and that's a real issue. With I, I know the design community has been instrumental in putting dark patterns as a label on the table for us to all talk about, but I don't think it goes down into what's happening at the system architecture level where we're pushing things that we wouldn't even recognize by that definition as a dark pattern anymore. So maybe put that back to the panel for further consideration. I think that's a really interesting point and might have an impact on our discussion about solutions. Kat, do you want to make a point specifically on that? Yeah, I first I want to um, ask you to clarify what you mean by system architecture uh, level, and then I'll, I have another follow-up as well. Well, there's a, there's a few dark patterns which I wouldn't necessarily say are integrated into the user interface, mm -hmm. but um, if you're using, for example, a combination of data points, profiling, and then that is indicating to you that you are should be doing something or it doesn't pop up like in the traditional sense of cookie banners or a notification. Um, and I think we need to start thinking more broadly about, I like the idea of moving towards deceptive design away from dark patterns because it is too commonly associated with user interfaces. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. there's darker patterns that are deeper than the ones that we see because we have to make a choice at a given so moment. So we agree that we're talking a manipulative, deceptive design rather than what was defined as a dark pattern. Can I, can I, can I add on yeah. that? Because I think I, I had a very um, similar issue that I can wanted to raise. Can you speak up, please? Um, yeah, this should also, be better. I can't see you. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can get up. Yeah, well, I'm uh, also from Leiden University, and I'm researching um, manipulation via behavioral advertising. So why am I saying that? Because... Yeah, we use words such as dark patterns or, or, or design features, but I think what Mark just mentioned, um, there is, um, like, why are these design patterns there? Like, why do we have user interface on the internet in that way? Like, so when we're talking about solutions, what do we have to regulate and what do we have to work on? Like, for me personally, I'm looking at what started it, what monetization of internet and how is it happening that causes than designers to come up with these uh, features and et cetera. So maybe the better way to 
refocus on these is manipulated practices such as behavioral advertising. Just, uh, okay, so that's a very relevant <coughs> point. Is folk, when you talk about solution, focusing on the effects and what you want to cure, rather mm -hmm. than talking about uh, manipulation generally. So presumably the companies do it to make money and to increase their bottom line. Um, is that what we're talking about? Um, yeah. Well, I think it's, it's, of course, not only about money per se. It's not only about selling things. It's also about obtaining more data yeah. and making sure that you are more powerful than other companies because you have the most data. Yeah. Um, and I think that is something that is very important to keep in mind. It's not only about financial transactions. Yeah. It's, it's very much about, you know, making sure you have the most data about someone compared to your competitor. There's not that much competition. We are trying to fix that through the DMA. Um, but, um, you know, that is, I think, a very important aspect. And indeed, um, when we're talking about dark patterns, they're indeed, you know, sort of if we're talking specifically about the manipulation, you know, I think my biggest frustration is turning off all of the things on which they can track me and then accept all anyway in the end and clicking on that button accidentally. Um, but that is in the end the, just the final part of the whole business model, which of course yeah. creates this perverse incentives to make sure that, that we have this. The whole idea of making sure we have um, internet and websites and apps that make us addicted, that make sure that we are on the platform as long as possible, that we give away as much information as possible. And like we're not only manipulated to give away data, we're also manipulated to stay on the platform very long. We see yeah. that, that it's very harmful. Yeah. So that kids are already addicted, yeah. uh, like, like toddlers are already addicted to be on, yeah. on smartphones and, and, yeah. and iPads. And I think, um, indeed, um, when we're talking about um, making sure that the internet is a, a safer place, um, where our privacy is protected, etc., um, we can't just talk about ending uh, dark patterns. We have to talk about a whole mind shift and a whole different set of making sure that there's not only a few big companies that rule the internet, and that we make sure that you know they adhere to the rules and that it's a place that is pluriform and where people are you know in control rather than the few shareholders that are now. Okay, so we seem to have already made the connection between this manipulative designs and platform power competition, manipulative design and uh, targeted profiling advertising, which are the two, you know. Um, can I turn to you, <laughs> Rebecca? The, the FTC has made, you know, you've had a huge hearing recently, I think back in February, on this phenomenon that went on the whole day and examined all the aspects. And you've recently taken, taken quite a few measures. Do you have, I mean, what are you addressing with your tools? And do you have enough tools in your toolbox to solve this issue? Yeah, it's a really good question. So um, I break it up. Oh, sorry about that. I'm trying to get close to the microphone, not break all of your eardrums. Um, I, I think about, well, let me start by saying this. We're at a very exciting moment at the Federal Trade Commission. Um, this week is the first full week we've had five sitting commissioners and a full Democratic majority, which uh, I've been at the FTC for four years, so this is a very exciting moment for me. And we were really happy to just welcome Alvaro Bedoya, who is a privacy expert and a real leading light in this field generally as the uh, fifth commissioner and the third Democrat. So I think there's a lot of exciting stuff to come. And I know I can speak for um, not just myself, but my colleagues, that we are really committed to fully examining the tools in our toolbox, in our existing toolbox, and figuring out how we can apply them effectively and creatively to address the biggest problems facing consumers in today's markets. Um, and this falls squarely into that bucket, uh, not just solving the problems of the recent or distant past, but being forward-looking and tailoring solutions, not just in terms of the subjects of our cases, but how we resolve them to be effective um, going forward and, and really put a halt to some very problematic practices we see in the marketplace. So what are the tools we have to do that? The, um, 
vast bulk of FTC work is done under Section 5 of the FTC Act, which pre prevents unfair and deceptive acts and practices. Historically, most of our privacy-related enforcement has been brought under the deception prong of that. And the deception prong is very powerful for us because it's pretty clear. Don't lie about what you're doing with data or otherwise, uh, or we will sue you. Unfairness is a portion that I think has been underutilized and holds a substantial amount of promise, but not without limitations. To meet the test of unfairness under the FTC Act, a practice needs to cause substantial injury that's not reasonably avoidable by the user and not offset by countervailing benefits. Um, that is a complicated test. It is both... Yes, I will repeat it again, and um, it is in statute, so you don't have to just take my word for it. It is literally Section 5 of the FTC Act. But unfairness is a practice, it has three prongs. Substantial injury that is not reasonably avoidable and not offset by countervailing benefits. Um, that's why we've used deception more, because <laughs> that's an easier test to meet. But if we want to move, you know, the, the deception solution is largely tell people more what you're doing and say it honestly. Uh, and I worry that that gets us into a universe where we just have longer and longer privacy practice policies and disclosures without real meaningful control or any substantive limitations on what are fundamentally unfair practices. So how do we bring unfairness, so how do we apply our unfairness authority to the kinds of practices that we see here? Where are we seeing uh, manipulative designs being used to cause substantial injury uh, it's pretty easy to say that they're not reasonably avoidable because they're manipulative, um, and it's difficult to identify countervailing benefits. But the link between injury and design is an important and difficult one. Yeah, go ahead. Um, can you please uh, tell us more about substantive injury part? Because um, if there is no... Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Can you tell uh, a bit more about the substantive injury part? Because it seems that it's related directly to like maybe physical harm or economic harm or something that is measurable in some way. And I'm curious if that is so. Because in some cases on, online, there are violations of autonomy which may not lead to any sort of substantive or measurable harm. So and substantial and measurable substantial. are not the same thing. I yes, want to be yes, very true, clear about that. Yeah. Um, we have brought cases certainly that tackle financial in injury, um, but also reputational injury. You know, we have brought historically unfairness cases where somebody's reputation has been injured um, and other privacy cases in that bucket. Uh, it is not a term that is defined in statute, which means we need to give it meaning through our enforcement action, sometimes by taking parties to court. Uh, I've advocated in my time at the FTC that there have been many cases where I thought uh, the conduct at issue gave, uh, rose to the level of unfairness, but we didn't plead an unfairness count because we got everything we needed out of a deception count. I think we should have been pleading it more to help build out that case. Um, and I think you can expect to see going forward a lot more extensive pleading of all of the law violations that we see. Um, but it is an area where we have a lot of development to do. So how do we develop the law? One, we bring cases. Um, either we take companies to court or we um, enter into settlements with them where we think the law has been violated and our settlements build out their own body of law. The second thing we do have authority to do under current law is issue rules using Section 18 of the Federal Trade Commission Act, which is a more cumbersome process than traditional U.S. rulemaking. We can only ban by rule a practice that meets the definition of a Section 5 violation, so is either deceptive or unfair, and also is prevalent. Uh, we can't do a sort of one-off practice ban. Uh, this authority has been available to the FTC since the 70s, has been used very, very little in recent decades. I think there's been this sort of conventional wisdom that it's too cumbersome to be worth the candle. I have been advocating for the last three years that we open one of these rulemaking proceedings. And to do that, it would start with an advance notice of proposed rulemaking that would ask lots of questions about exactly what I'm talking about. What are the injuries that are out there? How do we classify them as substantial? How prevalent are they? What are countervailing benefits? And a participatory record would allow everyone from consumer advocates, industry, academics, 
uh, politicians, technologists, to help us build out that expertise to consider whether rules might be appropriate. So we could bring enforcement. We have rules. Um, we can also do studies using Section 6B of our authority, and we're currently conducting a study about the data practices of social media and video streaming companies. Um, yeah, go ahead. I feel like I'm monopolizing this conversation, so I'm going to get to, I, I will I'll, answer your question and then, I'll, yeah. I'll come to you in a minute. Oh, sorry. <laughs> then the last point I was going to make is, uh, so there are more things that we can do, but we can't do everything. I think the law has a lot of limitations, some of which I've outlined right now. And so I would also love to see our Congress pass more targeted privacy legislation that put more, or data abuse legislation that put more concrete and clear statutory walls up around what kinds of practices are prohibited. Yeah, thank you very much for that. I would also love Congress to do that too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We've been campaigning for it for many years. Yes. Um, Kim, could I come to you? Um, the commissioner, and I'll come to you, sir, in a minute, okay? We just need to get everybody talking a bit. Um, so, so the commissioner has been talking about tools and enforcement at the FTC and what's missing. Can I come to you and ask you about the recent DSA provision on precisely this issue, whether you think that provision is enough, um, if it's not what's missing, and how do you see it being enforced? Well, um, I think um, what we managed to get into the Digital Services Act is a, is a very big step. I mean, it is, it is in there. Um, and that was really, really not something we took for granted uh, before going into the last negotiation. So it's in there. We are quite happy with that. Um, however, it's still, of course, going to be partially up to the Commission, partially up to um, the authorities to see um, what do we exactly mean. So indeed, are we only going to ban um, these complicated cookie banners or are we, for example, also looking at um, the manipulative design that keeps us scrolling forever and ever and ever and keeps us addicted to the platform. Because that's, of course, also a nudge. That's something that um, is perhaps not something we want, but it is something that is part of the design. Um, so that's going to be interesting, and we're really going to have to see what we can do about that. Um, so uh, yes, we're happy, but let's see what's what's next, what, uh, what comes out of the next steps. Then when it comes to enforcement, um, and this is, I think, going to be one of the most crucial things indeed, um, we've seen in the GDPR that it um, isn't great how it's going. Um, I don't think I'm saying something very new and exciting yeah. here. And the, the problem is that if we keep everything again to Ireland and make and and ask them to enforce everything. We know what happens. We know that that's not going to work, and we know that there's not enough capacity. And that's why I'm very happy that in the DSA we said that the European Commission should take a, uh, also a leading role in the enforcement. And um, what I'm personally quite happy about, because it was a proposal that came from my office, um, is that we uh, now decided that the very large online platforms have to pay to uh, make sure that the enforcement can also, you know, be done by people who can get paid properly so we can get, actually get the experts that we need. Because I think that is something, and I think it's something we learned also from, for example, the hearing that we had with Francis Hagen in the European Parliament, the Facebook whistleblower, who said, you know, the people who understand how all these algorithms and all these patterns work are really, really smart. And there are not that many people that understand it. So if you don't have enforcement on a European level, you'll never be able to have in every country enough people who can do the enforcement who will actually understand everything. So I think it's very important that we, have, that we get strong enforcement on the DSA and other legislations um, on the European level, and that they can then work together, especially when it comes to these very big online platforms, that they can work together, for example, with the Irish um, uh, Data Protection Authority, so we can make sure that they, you know, that they have the capacity and that we can make sure things happen correctly. Thank you for that. Kat, can, can I come back to you on these two points made by the Commissioner and, and the Member of Parliament? You've seen two different systems and legislative systems, but you know, the companies are the same on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, 
what do you make of it, both the policies and the solutions from, a, from an industry point of view? Yeah, so I think um, this is really fascinating to hear about uh, the policy side as someone who's in industry. I think for us, we, in order to actually be able to comply and stuff, we need clarity in these policies. Um, so I, I'm glad you brought up like spelling out what exactly are you banning, right? Um, just saying a blanket term of dark patterns, which I know some, we're actually trying to move away from that term just because it's a bit vague. Um, and really spelling out what exact deceptive designs are we talking about, um, whether it's on a system architecture level or, you know, a particular pattern, right? That's really important. Because um, the thing is, like, in the industry, we're going to use what we can use um, just to help, you know, get more time, money, and data from our users. And it's one of those things where, as a, even a, as a designer, it's so baked into the way that we work, right? When we're going to our bosses and we're doing performance reviews, they're asking us, how have you impacted your team? Or how have you impacted your, your division, right, or the product? And we have to spell out ways that we've, you know, allowed for engagement rates to go up with our product, right? And unfortunately, in our industry, we have associated um, things like engagement and, and clicks and whatnot as proxies of success for our products, because that's what makes us money. Um, so it's, it's so fundamentally baked into the way that we think about these things that like even when we're interviewing for new jobs, they're asking us about what we've done to help increase engagement rates for a particular product, right? And so I think that's something that we have to look at is the root cause of that, right? Um, and, and trying to, you know, not just do Band-Aid fixes, but also attack the, the actual reason why these companies are employing these patterns to begin with um, and seeing what we can do to curb their appetite for that. So we're talking about a concrete banning list. I think that's a, a good start, is just to really define some of these actual okay. things. Can I just ask, Kat, though, how do you reconcile the tension between clarity that comes from concrete prohibited practices and uh, risking whatever solution becoming stuck in time because the technology and industry practices move around and evade that? Like, how do you how do you work out that balance? That's a, that's a fantastic question, and I think that's like a good philosophical question for just the regulation of tech in general, because it's always going to happen like that. Um, and I think we have to figure out more, you know, agile ways to work hand in hand industry and policy to, to, to better regulate and adapt with the times, right? Because I think, um, at least especially in the States, industry will always try to, you know, it's, a, it's the wild west out there of like trying to figure out how they can get away with getting more money and whatnot. Um, and especially as we you know we have new mediums and new devices and, and new platforms for which we're designing, like there will be new deceptive design patterns. Um, and I think if, if there's some ways that we can have more of a, a multi-pronged approach that brings in all these different players and their perspectives to uh, not just one time in history, but multiple multiple times having like an intermittent kind of dialogue around this um, to adapt the ruling and, and, you know, as it goes on. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Finn, do you want to comment on all this? Yeah. And then it's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think there's some really good points here. And I, I also want to add to, you know, we have all these rules already, right? So we have consumer law, we have the data protection regulation here in Europe. Um, and we filed, um, I think three and a half years ago, we filed a legal, legal complaint against Google. Uh, because we uh, basically documented how they were using deceptive designs to trick users into giving up their location data. And this is a m problem at a massive scale. For those of you who were at the competition panel earlier today with Johnny Ryan, you could see how he demonstrated um, how Google were using dark patterns or deceptive design to, to basically increase, uh, improve their market position, get more data. And if you consider the fact that Google has a of market share of about 80 to 85% on the mobile operating market, it is a huge problem that they're using these deceptive designs to collect location data, one of the most sensitive data points that they then can collect in real time and combine with other data from all their other sur uh, sources of data, right? So what happened to that complaint? Well, it's still being handled at the Irish Data Protection Commissioner's office, three and a half years on. We don't even have a preliminary uh, decision on this case, and this is a huge problem. Uh, so we tried um, another avenue. So last year we filed a complaint against Amazon. We, we teamed up with consumer groups in Europe and in the US. 
um, and we filed a complaint uh, through the CPC network, which is another enforcement mechanism using consumer law. The problem there is it's like a void. We have, we have not heard a single word about how our complaint is being handled because of the secrecy rules. So they can't even share data. And the only thing we can achieve by using that mechanism is more transparency potentially from, uh, from Amazon and maybe a few concessions. But it doesn't create a precedent, so it doesn't do anything to create legal certainty, which is what we're talking about here, for all the other actors using deceptive design to trick their users. So I think, the, um, and if I may, can I ask to tell about some of the solutions to this? Uh, should then be obviously to, we need to revamp um, how we're doing enforcement, so we need to speed up enforcement. That could be done by countries putting more money into their uh, DPA so they can actually do uh, more cases because they've had a massive increase in cases. So we can't only blame the DPAs. They're designed to fail today because they don't have enough resources to do their job. So that's point one. Um, and then we need to look at how existing laws are, are working. And I would argue that they're not working very well today. So we need to use upcoming opportunities to improve the law. And I, there is a review coming up on consumer legislation here in Europe, very soon called the fitness check. And it's not very sexy, but that is another <laughs> avenue where you can put in real measures against these deceptive design practices. And then we need real remedies. It needs to really hurt for the companies. And you need to be able to have swift action. So this is also why I like the, the idea of having banned practices, because then you can have consumers reporting them out in the wild. And I think that could be a way, and then have swift take down mechanisms, and the service just go down until it's fixed, for example. Can you find innovative ways of doing it? It will actually uh, be a problem. And then obviously, the consumer uh, competition angle is really important, because as a consumer, right, you can detect these dark patterns, well, this deceptive designs. Uh, if you do, you're very good, right? But where do you go if there's nowhere else to go? Because there's either a lack of uh, interoperability, there's a lack of portability, uh, or there's no competition, so there's nowhere to go either way. So yeah, we have to look at these things uh, together. Um, and I believe like a combination of bans or specific practices in addition to a sort of more holistic approach where uh, you can have a more flexible definition of deceptive designs to intervene very quickly. And then I think we talked about business models, right? Um, and one very specific suggestion that's been up is ban of surveillance-based advertising. I really believe that's a way to go. Uh, whether you ban third-party data or cross-section data within the service, we can talk about that. But I think removing the incentive to collect so much data uh, would have a huge impact on how the, we see this in the wild. And then obviously also the points of addiction, dark patterns, into, you know, yeah. We, that, those are places where we can start. Well, thank you very much. That's a lovely agenda, uh, from, my, <laughs> from my perspective anyway. So you wanted to say something, and you've been very patient, and then we'll, we'll have some further questions. Thank you. Um, my name's Nicholas Wallace. I'm a reporter at MLEX. Uh, I have a question for the commissioner. You said that you are an advocate for new rulemaking on privacy at the FTC. You also mentioned that there is now a democratic majority on the FTC. Um, and that you are a part of that majority. Um, so when might we see that advance notice of proposed rulemaking and what might be proposed? Thanks. Uh, well, I can't obviously comment on anything that is non-public um, or anything that might be coming up at the FTC. I will just reiterate that I have been saying the same thing very consistently publicly since 2019 that I thought it would be great for us to get started on one of these long and time consuming processes. And I think that there's a lot of benefit just to opening a record. Um, so I'm hopeful that that is something, well, let me put it this way. I will keep saying that <laughs> until we get there. And so if everybody is bored with hearing me say it, then I am hopeful it will happen sooner rather than later. Thank you. I think I've seen two hands there. One is Johnny and one, yeah. Is the microphone? Can we pass the mic? Can we pass the microphone back? Oh, Nick, pass the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> so there's some bad news. So Finn, you were saying that three and a half years ago you filed a complaint about web and app activity, dark patterns to the Irish Data Protection Commission, and. Nothing has happened there. Nothing has happened there. Today, the European Commissioner for Justice, Didier Reinders, has posted on his Twitter account a photo op 
with him and Helen Dixon, the Irish Data Protection Commissioner. He says they had a very good meeting. I don't know if they were discussing your complaint. <laughs> they, <laughs> and you might not have thought it was a good meeting, but they thought they're, they're smiling. And I wonder, as they're celebrating six years since the GDPR, I think that tells us two things we should worry about. One, yes, the GDPR is still paralyzed because of Dublin, I apologize, and other places too. But it also tells us that there's a problem alive and well in DG Just, and that the country of origin problem, that means Ireland's a problem, is not the only problem. The European project is based on the idea that member states will totally mess things up, and when they do, the European Commission will take them to court and won't do photo ops. So this is bad news, Kim, for the DSA <laughs> and for the DMA. And moving the problem from the member states can solve nothing if there's a problem in Brussels. Okay, that was, that was a comment rather than a question. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I Hi. take yours and then we'll comment. Thanks. Silvia de Conca from Freie Universiteit Amsterdam. So I'm also working on manipulation or persuasion, I prefer to call it, but uh, um, I mean, there are several names anyway. But I have a question that kind of connects with what you were saying about the DSA and also your question about how do you make sure that um, a, um, a hard um, legislative intervention doesn't get obsolete too quickly. Because uh, in the past five years, I worked with smart speakers and so, you know, Alexa and Google Assistant, and I have cataloged their um, manipulative practices, and they don't have, for the most part, a visual interface. So some are visual prompts, I call them, others are uh, voice, vocal prompts, and others are the relationship that they establish, and because of the voice interaction and the anthropomorphization, they are they have a long-term relationship that goes beyond the addiction. It's a relationship, it's an emotional connection. And the DSA, I really like the, the uh, is it still Article 13? I'm not sure, 13A, I'm not sure, but the list. It's all visual dark patterns. And most of the dark patterns are made for the visual websites, it makes perfect sense. But there are more interfaces coming up, like the vocal one. So, and, and we can imagine more evolution in the sense we're talking 170 million between America and Europe sold of smart speakers. So in that, in that sense, would, for example, the DSA be robust enough for, for that? Or, or how are we even going to apply that or consumer protection in terms of obsolescence? Thanks. Thank you very much. So what do you think to Johnny's comment? And is the DSA concrete and robust enough from the lady there? Thank you. Oh, yeah. um, I don't know how well you can hear the people behind us, but uh, we can hear them very well. <laughs> um, so, um, well, Johnny, yes, um, it is. It is indeed something that that we have to to be on top of. Um, I I'm still have some hope that um, with some more resources, some things might get better because we can indeed hire more experts, but whether everything should stay within the commission or should be a separate regulatory authority, I think is not a discussion that has been played out yet completely and something that will definitely play up, especially if we're going to start seeing you know, how the enforcement on the DSA and DMA works. Um, then when it comes to the Alexas, I'm afraid that's indeed not completely within the scope either of the Digital Services Act, but it might be in the scope uh, of the Artificial Intelligence Act that's now coming up because there is a ban on manipulation and, it's in, and it, is a, it is an algorithm. Okay, I see a lot of shaking. <laughs> yeah, but it's can you not. be brief? Yeah, yeah we've but got it's not because the ban on manipulation that's in the AI Act has a super high threshold that I think it's never going to be reached because... <laughs> yeah, but only... we're not done with the AI Act yet, and that's what I wanted to say, okay, because yes, the maybe. ban on manipulation as it stands now in the AI Act doesn't mean anything, because it is about subliminal manipulation. How, how on earth will a consumer or a person ever know that they have been subliminally manipulated? How do you prove that? Yeah. 
if you don't know that you've been manipulated. And there's also other things indeed that are very problematic with it. But I do think that this ban on, strengthening this ban on manipulation, which is something we are gonna also put forward, I'm a shadow rapporteur on the AI Act, um, we're gonna put forward and, and we're working very hard on, it's gonna be super important and might also strengthen them through a certain sort of sideway, again, the Digital Services Act and the ban on dark patterns. So I think it's going to be very interesting to see how this discussion will play out in the, in the European Parliament, um, also in the other, uh, of course, institutions. But the Parliament is uh, is where where I am sitting, um, and I think that's that's the way to go. But then also, indeed, the the new consumer. Uh, law, um, yeah, we, the update of that is also a place where we where we have to look at this. I think it's something that you know it's we're we're talking a lot about the Internet of Things and all these things, um, but how do we actually make sure that you know your fridge doesn't manipulate you into buying something that you can't afford? You know, it's a it's a valid question that's often dismissed as something. Haha, what are you saying? But let's think about it at least. Yeah. I think, can I, I also, since I posed the question about the tension between clarity and breadth, um, I would also like to propose a solution, which is the non-exhaustive list. You can propose, uh, you can outline a list of practices that are illegal and have a catch-all that says, and other abusive practices or other unfair practices, this is not all of them, and so that you have clearly outlined uh, things that are problematic, but you are not limiting yourself in time or scope to those things about which you are aware at the time that legislation passes. This, incidentally, is also why I favor rulemaking, because I think rulemaking is a good way. It moves faster, as slow as it is. It's faster than legislation, especially in the U.S., um, and it's a way to keep updating and keep pace, make sure that the implementation of laws keeps pace with the facts on the ground and not and provides the clarity that we hear from industry that they want all the time. I will just call out, it makes me completely nuts to hear complaints that there is no clarity and we need clarity in the law. And at the same time, please don't let that FTC write rules because that would provide way too much clarity in the law. So, you know, I think that that is uh, a pretty a clearly farcical argument and we need to articulate that when we see it. I want to give clarity and clarity might mean that some things are clearly illegal. So clarity is a leitmotiv of this panel from all sides. Uh, Kat, do you want to comment on these questions or? I, I appreciate that, um, I don't know her name, but that they brought up the, the fact that there are these other mediums that are spinning up um, and we're going to have the metaverse soon and whatnot. And we, we do definitely have to be vigilant about these things. And I think um, those dialogues between industry and policy will definitely help. So, yeah. yeah, and just to build on that, I think that's a good point. And we're be, be, um, also, it's very important to look into the future, right? I, I really don't hope the metaverse becomes reality, but, um, but, but we do know that there's going to be more data, uh, there's going to be more computational power to process that data. It's going to be easier for companies to individualize deceptive designs, do A-B testing in real time on different groups. We know that's happening, for example, within the gaming industry where different designs are being used to trick users into paying, paying <laughs> lots of money on loot boxes, for example, just as one example. Uh, so we need to look into the future and we know that this is just going to become worse if we don't deal with it. And it's going to become more individualized. It's going to be harder to track, harder to document. It's already difficult to document. So um, yeah, we, we need to think into the future and make rules that are um, Good. See, there are many good, question, good questions in the audience here. Yeah. Right. We've got about six minutes left, so I'm going to take one, two, three questions. Can you be very brief and then final comments from the panel? Uh, oh, yes. My name is Claudio Agosti uh, from Tracking Exposed. In order to have uh, more clarity, I wonder if exists some way to measure dark pattern see that some interface is more de deceiving than, than other. Normally, it's used the number of clicks necessary to reach uh, a decision, but I wonder if something more uh, accurate can, uh, can exist and can be used. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I just realized we have more than six minutes left, cause so, so we are okay. Calm down. <laughs> um. Right, anybody wants to answer, Claudio? Or, yeah, shall we have... Two more, uh, yeah, 
you please. I already have the mic, so I'll, I'll quickly ask. Uh, it's Andrietta over okay. here. Hi. I, uh, I getting into see. getting into solutions. One thing that I haven't heard be mentioned. I think I like the idea of going to the genesis of things. I haven't heard uh, uh, anything about policy and going back to schools because everything I learned about design, I learned during human computer interaction. And that's where you shape what's being normalized and what's not. So when these kids get into industry, they can protest or have, uh, be able to be vocal about a mismatch of their values. So how do you think we can approach that? Maybe that's for you. That's a fantastic point, and I, I appreciate that you brought up the normalization aspect because it truly is normalized. These practices, like design is one of those industries where we copy and paste from everyone, right? That's why you see every app that has like a stories feature, um, like even LinkedIn, which is so weird. But yeah, so we, we copy and paste, and when we see that something's effective, like a particular deceptive design pattern, it's not you know hard to imagine why you'd copy and use that when your boss is telling you, hey, we need to raise our engagement numbers for this month or this quarter. And so these things are taught on the job. They're taught, as you said, in schools, in boot camps. You know, th there's literature about how to get users hooked, right? Um, and so it's super normalized. And, the, you know, I was saying before the road has been paved. Um, you mentioned A-B uh, testing. Also nudging, right, which actually comes from policy. But nudging is another example of, like, it's a very fuzzy line right, between nudging and deceptive designs. Um, and other practices like gamification, right? We talk about gamifying experiences, right? When you have an app like Duolingo trying to make everything a reward that you that gets your brain like you know really bent on getting that award, reward and spending more time on the app. So these things are all very commonly used, very commonly taught. You there's not really any shaming around it in the industry. It's just kind of accepted. And another point that I want to raise is what you said about futures, right? This is our moment to define what acceptable internet or, you know, digital rights we have, right? You know, for the future generations of, we don't want our kids to grow up th thinking, yeah, this is totally normal for me to have to, you know, figure out how the this platform is tricking me and then to be more wary about that. And I think it comes back to like, these should not be things that we have to look out for ourselves on our own, right? This should be something that's baked into our societies, into our you know, legislation, etc. Thank you very much for that. I think we had, yes, please, could you identify yourself? Sir? Yes, my, my name is Daniela Simanovic. I'm from DPO Net, Romania. I would like to be very short and brief, if I, if I can. Uh, first oh, please, of all, please. I, would like, <laughs> I would like to uh, do a comment regarding the consumers. Even if we don't pay with our credit cards or with cash, we pay with our personal data. Mm -hmm. So we are consumers, no matter what. Uh, second, about the addiction. Uh, it seems to me that we passed very lightly on the harm, on the idea of harm, because uh, the economic loss, the money loss, it's very obvious. We see it on, on the spot. But on the other hand, this addiction with, in time, negative cons consequences on financial loss, time loss, it's created on a very young age. And now, thank you to my previous, uh, the previous speaker that said, what would do we do about the education? But I'm not talking about the education on how to trick persons to stay more online, to spend more money, because these companies are not getting richer just with money, and they don't collect so much data just to create a fluffy mattress to sleep very uh, comfortably at night and collect the data for the sake of collecting the data. Data is money. So the aim is to make money. Yeah. That's why those companies are created, right? They're not charities. Now, what can we do to educate the young generation not to fall into these traps. Thank you very much. That's a very important point about school education, yes? I mean... Can, yeah, I will respond quickly there. Um, I have four kids, 
This is a very personal issue for me that I think about all the time. Um, I think it is important for kids to be technologically literate, civically literate, but I think it is also really important that the burden not just fall on the children and not on their parents to protect themselves. Uh, we would like them to do that if possible, but that's why I think going back to what are the root causes and thinking about substantive limitations on how data, what data can be collected and how it can be used is really important because otherwise we end up in a situation where the bird, all of the burden lies on the people who are least able to effectively protect themselves uh, and, and none of it is on the people who are profiting from the conduct. So I think it's really important whether it's addiction, whether it's privacy, uh, whether it's market power. No, I, I know. I, I don't want to enter into a discussion about education, so, yeah, yeah. No discussion. I was just wanting to add that for the companies, it's a win-win situation. They gain money economically or they gain time spent on the Internet. Yeah. Those companies never lose. Yeah, true. So... Any other questions or comments from this doctor audience? Very please. small question. Two of you mentioned that we should find out the root cause, but you ne never explicitly said so. So maybe you have a suggestion of what the root cause of the problem is, and maybe all of you can answer, uh, answer that just to make it explicit. Uh, what is the root cause of the problem uh, here? All right. So in my opinion, the root cause of the problem is that there are a few very big companies who um, make sure that we get addicted to their platform and that uh, spread um, content that creates the most interaction and clicks, uh, which is unfortunately often hate and disinformation, um, make sure that we stay as long as possible uh, for money. That's the root cause. That's the problem. They want, they have to just, and the only thing that they feel, the only people they feel that they have to have accountability towards are their shareholders. And um, if, um, you know, and, and I think you said it very well, you know, this clicks and interaction is indeed, you know, what they think know creates the most money. So that is what they're, they're basing, the, basing everything on. And that creates for them even more power again, because they know that people will get uh, uh, agitated, they will stay longer on the platform, and then again, uh, will fall for even more of the traps, you might call it, um, that they've built for the people. So I think um, this whole um, making sure we have as much clicks and interaction to get as much profit as possible, I think that's the root cause. And I think um, indeed uh, targeted advertising is one of the, uh, the clearest things that we could do to, if we put a full ban on targeted advertising, it would be um, one very important step, but also, um, you know, linking that to uh, a ban on, on dark patterns to just give away your data. Um, I think uh, would be the, the most important second step. And that's, yeah, it will indeed change completely the way these platforms make money. Um, but I think that's necessary in order for, you know, uh, a society to stay healthy and the internet to stay something that is actually something positive. Uh, Kat, what is the root cause? I think you summed it up really well. And I think we live in a surveillance capitalism um, and these companies are trying to capitalize off of our attention and our time. Um, and like this one lady said, the, you know, data is money in that sense. Um, and so I think that underpins you know why we act the way we do within companies, why we create these these proxy metrics of success um, that we use to benchmark our performances and whatnot, um, and it drives all of that. So, I'll I'll pivot a little bit because I agree with a lot of the assessment of the root causes. So I want to talk just briefly about what I think of as the kinds of solutions that really get to those root causes. So I find very interesting and appealing the idea of substantive limitations on what data can be collected and how it can be used. So I am, so minimization com combined with purpose and use limitations would mean that companies can only collect the data that's necessary to provide you a product, consistent with your expectations when you use that product, and only use it for those purposes, which means they cannot use your entire browsing history to serve you ads. Uh, and I think that 
that if you have those limitations in place, these incentives to keep everybody online and all the clicks and everything that Kim was talking about also are substantially diminished as are some of the big market power problems that we see. So I think it's, I think that's a part of the solution that requires a lot of conversation and exploration. Um, yes, and before I give you, Finn, the word, um, I found it very interesting that you commented earlier that uh, in the US at least, if you talk about banning targeted advertising, that you infringe freedom of speech. But if you talk about limiting collection of data, you can actually implement that. Yeah, I mean, I think the goal is to figure out how do you solve the problem consistent with respecting everybody's uh, legal rights and constitutional rights um, and what our courts will say. And so making sure that we are looking not just at, uh, at, at all the different ways to cut off the spigot that is fueling I'm mixing my metaphors here, but cut off the fuel of the fire um, uh, of the data conflagration is really important. Finn, what's the route? <laughs> no, I, I don't think I can say anything else than what's already been said. So um, I, I, I just want to answer the question about education, right? So it's, it might not be a quick fix to what we're saying, but so I'm, I'm also... Um, I have a day job at Norwegian Consumer Council and a part-time job at the Transatlantic Consumer Dialogue. But I happen to also be writing a white paper uh, for the Norwegian, uh, for, as an independent, um, for the Norwegian uh, government. So we're handing in a white paper together with, uh, we've been also experts, and we're looking at what can we do in Norway, one country, right, to improve privacy and, and rights in general. And one of the aspects that we've looked at is because you know, we have lots of public procurement rules in the EU, so there are like, limits to what you can do in a country. One of the things, though, we've seen where we could actually do something, every member state can do something, is what do we do in the public sector? So in schools, for example, why are we allowing Google, Apple, and Microsoft to invade our schools? I'm not saying they shouldn't be in our schools, but that has happened without any major discussions at what impact it has on training our children to become super users of those particular brands. And then obviously we're being trained in the dark patterns, we're being trained to share our data, we're being trained to look at the commercials that they provide us because these platforms are not advertisement free. I just uh, received, a, um, just as a random example, uh, I just received a, a screenshot from a, a worried parent last week where his daughter had received, 12-year-old daughter, had received a dieting pill advert on her school tablet. Just to give you one example. So this is where, we, if with good public procurement, good public rules, you could actually change the power dynamics a little bit and you can get public services or you can get providers that respect basic rules and respect dignity and autonomy of users. You know, it won't be a quick fix, but it's a place to start. Uh, and I just want to also uh, re repeat, and I probably won't say much more after this. So uh, I'll say enforcement, enforcement, enforcement. You know, we have laws. Let's use them, and then also improve the laws we have. I think that's super duper important. And Johnny Ryan, we need to do something about the DPC, right? So um, one last uh, mm -hmm. uh, one last option there is that it's been floating the idea of giving the EDPB more power. What about giving them more power to deal with trans uh, border disputes? for example, that's, that's on the table right now. Why don't we do that? Why don't we consider it at least and take some power away from single bottlenecks? And maybe, maybe the DPC will improve, but we can't wait any longer. Okay, thank you very much. Um, unless there's more questions, we had... Um, Just one more question. Right, okay, I can't see very well because I got this light shining in my eye. Can somebody... Yeah, she's getting the microphone. Yeah. It's going. Hi, um, I have one quick, straightforward Can you question. Tell us your I hope. Name, please. Yes, my name is Maria de Villeneuve. I work at BNP Paribas, um, and my question was just to the commissioner, which is: Is a settlement truly a win? Oh, that's such a good. It is not a straightforward question. Um, <laughs> I, I have I have opposed settlements 
including settlements as high as $5 billion, because I didn't think they constituted a win, because I didn't think they would effectively deter either the specific company or the market. I think a settlement can be a real win if it has terms that will send a clear message, will prohibit the offender from repeating offense, and will send a clear message to the market about what conduct is prohibited and why it is not only unlawful but unprofitable to engage in that conduct. But by its nature, a settlement is something a company is going to agree to. So uh, I think we have to be very wary about companies being willing to pay money that they can afford to spend to get out of meaningful changes in their conduct and behavior. So the short answer is it can be a win, but what makes it a win is not the dollar value, but how effective it is in disciplining the behavior of not only the company under order, but the market generally. Thank you. Can you uh, pass the microphone to them? Okay, that's the last question, and then we wrap up. Okay, thanks for the brilliant panel. Um, just a, I have a quick question. I think the problem also is of a business model. So maybe in Europe, at least, we need uh, just to help uh, small and medium enterprises to, to, to grow up and have more power, no? And also, I completely agree with what you said about schools and opening the doors to big platforms. I think it's completely crazy. Thank you. So a good competition question. Yeah, I think that's a great note to end on um, because what you're pointing to is the fact that we have a problem not just with data and the business model, but with market power and the inability of small and medium-sized companies to meaningfully compete against the large companies with the biggest data and uh, empires. And so I think absolutely one of the things I love about being at the Federal Trade Commission is that we not only can, but we must look at both competition and consumer protection questions. Uh, we haven't historically done that in a very integrated way, but that's something that um, we are really focused on now. And I think it's the only way to meaningfully solve these problems is to keep in mind both the competition and the consumer protection elements. And in a perfect world, we would have many companies, especially small and medium-sized companies, competing to provide more privacy-protective, uh, better quality products in more innovative ways. And that is not what we're necessarily seeing in the market right now and a sign that we have a problem. Thank you very much for that. Uh, can I ask you all to... Um make a one minute wish comment <laughs> uh, where do you see us going um, in any order you prefer I'll let my last co I just said a lot so I'll let my last comment stand as my last comment in terms of making sure that we are addressing all aspects of this problem which very much includes thinking about competition thank you Kim yeah I think what what is crucial is indeed how we're gonna define dark patterns and if to see if also you know this this making you know kids addicted to platforms will be will be part of it and if not uh, how are we going to to fix that and secondly i think um you know a ban on manipulation in general and strengthening consumer uh, law in that in that respect i think is going to be one of the most crucial things for the coming years to do thank you cut yeah um and i i just want to say i think I would love to see some of these ideas that were presented today uh, around enforcement and around like developing comprehensive bands and, and flexible ones as well to come to fruition. And I think within the design and tech industry, I would love to see more accountability and just the opposite of normalizing these practices, right? Having a, a really like a, awakening moment and actually holding ourselves accountable in that sense, but that's definitely a cultural shift. So, yeah. Well. Yeah, um, what more can I say? I, I, I know there are a lot of researchers here, and I, the work you do is really, really important. We need, you know, more, we need to keep researching these things. We need more evidence. We need to look at this from different angles. As we hear today, this is, it has impact on our dignity. It has impact on competition. It has impact on our basic consumer rights, our human rights. 
uh, we need more political leadership. You know, it's fantastic that this discussion is already at the, at the European level, at the FTC. The FTC has done also already done great work at this, you know, but we need to keep the pressure up because we haven't solved this problem. And then uh, one last request, please take some reports. Uh, they're right here in front, so when you leave, if you want a report from us, uh, we brought them all the way from Norway, we don't want to carry them back. So uh, <laughs> on that, on, on also on that note, please also give us, um, we also need uh, input, right? So please let us know what you're doing. Send us, um, send us uh, uh, tips on things that are happening in the wild, stuff we should do. Uh, at least I can promise at the Norwegian Consumer Council we're going to do more. We're publishing a report next week, which will focus a bit on this topic as well. Um, so we're going to definitely keep working on this, and I hope we get all everyone on board to do that. So great, great conclusion from my partner here. So I wouldn't have much to add except that I want to support very strongly his call for all these brilliant researchers to come and help us because we're very good at advocating and campaigning and you know the Norway Consumer Council has done brilliant research but we need a cooperation platform together which is very very important and and one of the sort of main messages I get from this panel is let's develop a concrete banning list which has a general abusive provision at the end <laughs> which will help the industry and all of us to enforce better. Thank you very much. Thank you all the audience. <laughs>